Uh, let's connect with uh, Nitin Rakesh to talk about market fundamentals. Nitin, good morning. Great to have you back on ET now. Uh, Nitin, if I map uh, Indian markets in the last six days, Indian markets have managed to move up despite uh, global odds. But given the way how globally things are stacked up, the fact that fear once again is occupying center stage and markets are a bit worried about the fate of fiscal cliff, do you think in the near term a lot of uncertainty will dominate Indian markets? Uh, morning, Nikunj. I think, uh, you know, as you rightly said, uh, it looks like over the next few weeks we'll have to focus on what's going on in, in the political world. I think we've focused on the U.S. elections, a little bit on the handover in China. But let's keep an eye on what happens in Greece over this weekend, uh, you know, whether they're able to pass the austerity bill or not, because if not, then we are staring at some scary things next week. And also, let's, you know, let's keep in mind that in two weeks from now, we have uh, potentially some drama likely to unfold in, in New Delhi as well. So I think, you know, as you rightly said, uh, over the next few weeks, it's politics that will drive the, the sentiment. Uh, from a macro perspective, clearly, uh, I think the, the Indian markets have seen a lot more comfort than they ever did uh, in the last two years. Uh, you know, whether it was from the earnings cycle perspective, whether it's from margins point of view, interest rate cycle, reform pressure, you know, the will to move forward, the global liquidity seems fairly uh, comforting. One of the reasons why the Indian markets reacted positively yesterday was that QE3 will likely to kind of continue to stay. So I think uh, even though the global macro environment is, is, uh, is mixed, I think domestically, uh, you know, things aren't looking that bad, barring, you know, the political, uh, uh, you know, drama that we're likely to see over the next, you know, couple of weeks. I think just want to draw your attention to how the IT basket is panning out and we are seeing sharpish knocks coming in despite the fact that Cognizant's numbers overnight were little better than expected. Do you think there are large concerns on, uh, you know, what's going to happen with outsourcing now? I think, uh, you know, the, the pitch of rhetoric is the highest just before the elections. Uh, the Cognizant numbers effect is more because the guidance for Q4 or which is the December quarters lower than what people expected it to be. But again, you know, keep in mind that, uh, you know, they, they have a good track record of beating the guidance. I think from an overall sector perspective, uh, I don't see, you know, how you're not going to get mid-teens growth for the industry as a whole, which I think given the current, current global context is not a bad place to be in. You know, the currency still seems fairly uh, comfortable, comfortably poised for the IT companies to, to protect their margins. The global demand environment isn't fully destroyed. You know, and if the U.S. stays stable, I think you'll continue to see uh, slow but steady growth of discretionary IT spending as well. A lot of companies are under severe pressure to cut costs, so I think that al always is, is, a, is, a, is a silver lining on the, on, the, on the horizon for IT outsourcing companies given the ability to provide that kind of comfort. Issue is not so much more at the sector level. I think the issue is much more which company do you back, and every company has a different uh, you know, evolution cycle that they are in right now. So I think you know, if you pick the right, bus the right uh, businesses to buy, you can still make uh, fairly decent returns from the sector. Where are you picking your spots in IT? Which are the hostels you're betting on? Well, given that I am in the sector today, uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, I, I don't think I can give you a, a reasonably uh, objective answer, but I think uh, clearly the, the, the kind of uh, pressure we've seen on Infosys uh, in terms of just the business fundamentals uh, and the transition that they need to make from a, a leadership pr perspective as well as from, from the way they're structuring their business model, that clearly is an out-of-favor stock. I think, uh, you know, the, the, the likes of TCS have really given market a lot of cheer in terms of, uh, you know, how they can continue to grow at, at, at a fairly robust pace ahead of the industry growth, even at that scale. So, you know, I probably, you know, say that, you know, you need to judicially pick, pick the stock based on where they are in their, in their business, business uh, model and uh, what kind of footprint they have, uh, you know, outside of the U.S. as well. Nathan, a word on Tata Motors' is earnings and on a standalone basis, it's been quite disappointing. Do you think in the next few quarters, the consolidated numbers with JLR would make up for Tata Motors' uh, domestic losses? I think, uh, you know, it's important for that stock, uh, for that stock to sustain, it's important that the domestic cycle turns around as well. And I think if we start seeing the interest rate cycle become favorable for commercial vehicles, I think you might see that, that leg up because... CVs will probably benefit, uh, will be the early beneficiaries of that cycle turning around as the domestic macro situation improves. Uh, hard to say whether that will happen in the next one quarter or two quarters, but clearly I think that's something that the market will want to see. Otherwise, it's really a global story for Tata Motors as of now, and, and that has held up the stock fairly well in terms of at least providing that, that global growth cushion. You think Tata Motors, given the kind of valuations it is trading at, just six, seven times, uh, based on FI14 estimates, 
could be a good value in a cheap stock at these levels and in next one year the stock easily could appreciate by 30 40 percent uh, again as i said it's hard to say whether it's going to take uh, one or two quarters but i think as if you bet on the interest rate cycle then it's not a bad place to be in given that uh, you you then have the second engine that will kick in which is the domestic growth which was lacking so far mm. but then in uh, last uh, two years markets have only focused on company which have uh, or companies rather which have a predictable business model strong strong return on equity a uh, strong uh, you know return on capital and which have uh, ability to generate lot of dividend but do you think that trade is now getting matured and markets should not focus on high quality stocks which are not trading at uh, you know extremely rich valuations uh, and because quality never goes out of fashion so keep in mind that while markets have focused more on free high free cash high dividend paying capability low leverage I think that will always be in 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 uh, in favor. The issue really is, from a valuation point of view, you may see some rotation trade going into some of the relatively inexpensive sectors. So, for example, PSU banks, or to some extent, capital goods and 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 the in, you know uh, auto space, where you are you are likely to see a slightly more uh, bump on valuation perspective, given the cycle is turning in their favor. But having said that, I think quality stocks with high ROEs, high free cash, low leverage. high pricing power they'll never go out of fashion and and if you have a 3 to 5 year horizon i think those will always have a place in the portfolio market criteria open pick and choose from the large cap space mid cap space or the small cap space or even better the micro cap space but identify some hidden gems for our viewers well that's a that's a tough one i think uh, i'm giving you 6000 stocks <laughs> <laughs> I think you know as I said uh, if you judiciously judiciously mix uh, some of the the leading consumption names uh, and have you know some of the early movers from the from the capital goods side you know an LNT or a Thermax uh, and potentially some auto names you know a two wheeler name uh, an M&M uh, or even a Tata Motors and then go even on the other side and look at some of the discretionary names like uh, uh, like titan you know given that the strength they're seeing in the jewelry business i think you probably have a good mix of of a portfolio right there if you are a brave heart and you want to actually really play the market then you can also look at you know real estate and infra but and the high beta names but that's really uh, a very very uh, i would say the the end of the spectrum uh, not something that you know i would recommend at this stage but clearly i think it's a stock specific market uh you have to have a have quality in the portfolio and then and you you start mixing it up with with some of the pockets of uh, undervaluation like psu banks and and potentially auto and and some um, uh cap goods mm. you think what about real estate would you club that in that basket as well underperformers which could show a technical rebound uh that aside do you fundamentally believe in these companies Uh, at this point i don't i think for a simple reason that a lot more work needs to get done for us to actually really know the strength of the balance sheets uh, you know we saw the first wave of, of balance sheet strengthening done in 2009 10 uh, but i don't think at this point in time i would say that even construction uh, or pure infra or real estate is something that uh, i would bet on yes from a technical point of view you know as the markets you know bounce around the interest rate cuts they will see see a bump up but from a fundamental point of view from having them having them in your portfolio for a long term nature i think it's you always will have a cloud over over these names till such time that we have all the governance issues out of the out of the way and we have the nexus that we we normally hear about uh, you know taken care of do you think stocks like hul and itc at the current juncture they are uh, just a technical buy they no longer uh, are an intellectual buy Well, I think a lot of the juice is out, but having said that, uh, you will still see steady growth numbers, both from uh, you know the discretionary space and the staple space, and both of them have a pretty good play in those. Uh, you know the way uh, ITCs, other businesses, non-tobacco businesses have started to shape up. You know clearly puts us uh, puts that stock also firmly in the in the basket of actually having those uh, the the consumption play much more than just tobacco. So you know, yes, they are expensive, but they've always been expensive. You know, they're relatively uh, you know better off today than they were, I would say, two months ago in terms of the valuation. But they would always find place in the portfolio because that's what gives you stability from a long-term perspective. Mm-hmm. Then you just talked about beat, beaten PSU banking names, autos as well as cab goods. Give us some color on the names that you were talking about and what would uh, be a good buying opportunity at this juncture. Well, again, I think if you just see the, you know, pick a PSU bank, uh, almost all of them are in the 0.5 to 0.7 price to book range. Um, you know, take something like even an SBI. I don't think you know you can go wrong with with, and this is probably going to be the leader as the as the PSU sector turns around, and you know we'll see the numbers tomorrow and know 
how good or how bad the, the provisioning number is. Uh, but again, you know, you can go down the spectrum and, you know, whether it's a BOB, uh, you know, or, or any other name that, that comes in the top five, seven names on the PSU bank space, I think you'll probably, you know, go right with, with most of them. So the basket of PSU banks in itself is a fairly good, good play over the next, I would say, 12 to 18 months. Uh, again, on the auto side, you know, I think the two-wheeler space got some hit based on the slowdown with the festive season seems like it should revive some of those fortunes. And if you do see interest rate cuts between now and the end of the year or, or January, I think, again, that will get a little bit of boost as well.